Good evening and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of all of us at the locally based, independently owned bookstore, Books and Books, in Miami, Florida, and in partnership with Miami Book Fair, it's a pleasure to welcome you to a virtual evening with Jefferson Morley to discuss his novel, Scorpion's Dance, The President, The Spymaster, and Watergate. Jefferson Morley is a journalist and editor who has worked in Washington journalism for over 30 years, 15 of which were spent as an editor and reporter at the Washington Post. The author of The Ghost, Our Men in Mexico, and Sto Snowstorm in August, Morley has written about intelligence, military, and political subjects for Salon, The Atlantic, and The Intercept, among others. He is the editor of JFK Facts, a blog, and he currently lives in Washington, D.C. To moderate this evening's conversation, we're joined by Fernand Armandi. Just a quick reminder that throughout this evening's broadcast, you can post questions below. There's a little ask a question feature at the bottom of the screen. And please order your copy of Scorpion's Dance from Books and Books and support independent bookstores. And now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests to the virtual stage. Hello. Good evening. Welcome. Pleasure to be here with you. It's so nice to Hi. have you. Good to be here. <laughs> I'll let y'all <laughs> take over. All okay. Right. Thank you so much. So thank you all for joining. And I, I really think you're in for a special treat. Whether you know every last historical nugget about what happened at Watergate, or this is your first time really coming to learn about those events that took place 50 years ago this month, uh, this is going to be a fascinating conversation because what Jeff is going to reveal here based on his new book, Scorpion's Dance, which I, I absolutely encourage you to pick up a copy. By the way, you can do that at any time during the conversation at the link below in green. But what's so incredible about this book is that it reveals scholarship on Watergate that up until now has never been revealed. And Jeff has really brought some things to the forefront. So, Jeff, welcome. Uh, it's good to be here with you in Miami, virtually yeah. at least. Yes, I've been I, I've been looking to this for a long time. You know, Miami runs throughout the Watergate story. There's a there's definitely a Miami subtext. So this is a good place to talk about this subject, even if only remotely. So, Jeff, before we get into the particulars, I'm always interested in the origin story of books and how one comes to them. Because, you know, one thing that there is a lot of is there's been a lot of books written on Watergate. But before we get into the specifics of what you actually reveal, which I think is something I've never seen on this subject for the first time in 50 years, despite a lot of the plethora of books. Tell me how in your author's path you decided to end up writing a book about Watergate. Well, it was it was a very indirect path. Um, about 10 years ago in 2012, I came across a site called NixonTapes.org, which had been set up by uh, Luke Nichter, a pro history professor at Texas A&M. And so I was interested in the Watergate story just in general, and I was browsing through it. And having written a couple of books about this, the CIA, I looked for CIA figures in that collection of tapes. These were White House tapes that had been made during the Nixon presidency and then had just been collecting dust. Nobody had really done anything with them. So the, this professor put them online. And as I was looking through his index or catalog of conversations, there was a page of conversations between Richard Helms, the director of the CIA, and Richard Nixon, the president. And in there, Nichter said, this is the only collection of tape recordings that we have between a president and his intelligence chief. And I thought, wow, that's that like that's a story. You know, I and so I kind of filed it away and I played around with it and nothing ever came of it. I couldn't I couldn't quite make it cohere as an article. I didn't know what I wanted to do. And then when I was thinking a couple of years ago about the 50th anniversary of Watergate, I thought, wow, maybe I could construct a book around those conversations. And so I revisited that. And that gave me the idea to look at the Nixon presidency, I mean, the Watergate affair, not just as a chapter in the Nixon presidency, which is usually the way it's presented, but as a chapter in the history of the CIA. And if you do that and trace back the roots of all the people who were in the CIA who were involved in the Watergate affair and how they related to President Nixon, all of a sudden the Watergate affair begins to look a little bit different. And that's what this book does is it reframes the Watergate affair to look at it as a chapter in the history of the CIA. And that's why 
like you said, it feels revelatory because I don't think there's any other approach that has quite looked at the, the, the affair with that angle. That's absolutely correct. And, and with that spirit, Jeff, I really saw three secrets, if you will, three revelations that came out of this book that not only have I never seen in the Watergate literature before, but they're almost three types of revelations that clarify a lot of questions that over the years, even Woodward mm -hmm. and Bernstein of Watergate fame have never been able to even answer, let alone tackle. Yeah. And one of them, I think, starts with something that you hinted at. And just for a little bit of historical context for our audience, you know, in the public consciousness, the Watergate affair was defined in terms of the media and how the media was able to, in essence, uh, uncover wrongdoing coming out of the executive branch, specifically the White House. And then the other agency that was revealed or the other institution of government that was revealed to have played a role that tantalized for years, but in the year, I think it was 2005, became light, was the FBI. Because the famous source for Woodward and Bernstein, mm -hmm. uh, throat, who became kind of his own little catch-all and an icon, was revealed to be Mark Felt, the number two person at the FBI. So it was a story of the media, the FBI, and of course the actions in the White House by Nixon and his fellows that brought down a presidency. But what your book does with this first major revelation is brings to light the hidden but essential role of an agency that has always kind of been seen to be on the periphery, but in reality, as you reveal in Scorpion's Dance, may have been the propulsive force, not just behind explaining Watergate, but some of the things and, and uh, episodes around that period of time. Tell us about that. Yeah, so um, the uh, the role of the CIA, you know, we we have we in the Watergate story, we have the kind of the classical telling of it is all the president's men, and that's the narrative you alluded to. You know, a, a free media, a free press goes after a lawless president and holds him accountable. The good guys win. It's a good story. Those guys are great reporters. You know, we like that myth. You know, us reporters, we like that myth. I'm not saying that's false or anything like that, but you know, the word CIA barely occurs. I think it's said once in the movie um, and it barely occurs in the book. And so it just wasn't an issue for them. They didn't really look at it or consider it. You know, they thought about it because I've spoken with Woodward and Bernstein about this. They had their suspicions, but, you know, they couldn't get the story and they didn't get the story. Now, after 50 years with a lot of declassification, a lot more testimony, we understand much better that, you know, Director Richard Helms recommended the burglar in chief, Howard Hunt, to the White House a year before the break in. He, Bob Haldeman, there's a White House tape, and Haldeman tells Nixon, Helms says he's quiet, ruthless, careful. He's on our side. You know, so Helms had recommended Hunt. James McCord, uh, the second most important burglar, for example, senior officer in the CIA's Office of Security, which is the the agency's internal police force. And um, uh, he had a picture on the wall of his office autographed by Dick Helms with deep appreciation, Dick Helms. So Wood Hunt and McCord were much closer to Helms than anybody really knew at the time of the burglary. At that time, the CIA put out a statement and said, these men are retired and we've had no dealings with them since their retirement. That was some would say a lie. It was the CIA, I guess, would say it's a cover story. It, it certainly wasn't true. Um, they had lots of dealings with them. When McCord bought the eavesdropping equipment for the burglary, the guy who sold it to him said, I'm not going to sell it to you unless I have a letter from the CIA saying this is OK. The CIA provided the letter. Hunt was talking to Tom Karamasinas, his case officer, who was a deputy to helm. So the CIA had a back channel to the burglars the whole time. So. First, before we get deeper into the role of the agency, you, you keep mentioning this individual, which I think is just one of the fascinating, certainly one of the central characters in Scorpion's Dance. And it is, of course, at the time, the director of Central Intelligence, Richard Helms. Now, there have been a lot of CIA directors over the decades since the founding of the agency, but, but Richard Helms really was a unique director in and of himself. Tell us a little bit about the peculiarities, if you will, of the man and why it is so essential to understand Helms if you want to understand the CIA's role in Watergate, both in the period of Helms before 
the Watergate episode and affair, and certainly during and after. Yeah. So uh, Dick Helms, the eighth director of the CIA, he holds that position from June 1966 to January 1973, almost you know six and a half years, almost seven years. So one of the longest serving CIA directors, um, career CIA officer, joined the agency when it opened its doors in 1947, made his reputation as a very careful operator and able administrator. Helms was a classic East Coast gentleman, well-spoken. People who were friends with him loved the guy. You know, a uh, very charming man, very affable, impressive. But as Henry Kissinger observed, his smile did not always include his eyes. He was a very canny figure. And he came up against a man who was totally the opposite of him, Richard Nixon, a very anxious, unsmooth guy from the West Coast, from a poor background, um, very resentful and, 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 and of the CIA and, and mistrustful. And so... They come, they come together uh, in 1969 when Nixon assumes the presidency, and he keeps Helms on as CIA director as at the recommendation of President Johnson. And Helms, to, to his credit, manages Nixon. He flatters him, you know, because Nixon was always very insecure. And, and Helms writes in these letters, you were wonderful on TV last night, Mr. President. And, and, and Nixon, you know, he, he ate that up. What they had in common, for all their cultural differences, their politics were pretty similar. I mean, Nixon sort of assumed that because Helms was from the CIA, he must, he must be some East Coast liberal. Well, he was certainly from the East Coast, but he was no liberal. He was very hardline anti-communist, really just like Nixon. And Helms backs up Nixon in his own policy agenda. And this is important to, to talk about when, how did their collaboration lead to Watergate? Well, Nixon, as, as the opposition to the Vietnam War mounts in his, during his first term, and the opposition becomes more violent, um, he becomes obsessed with spying on his enemies. And he wants authority from his government to break into, to conduct what they call black bag jobs, to looking for information about people who might be working with foreign intelligence services while opposing the war, that sort of thing. He wants to expand that authority legally. And when he does that, he gets the wholehearted support of Dick Helms. And incidentally, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover, who people think of as like the arch reactionary, the repressive guy of the U.S. government at that time, he was he was much more reluctant than Helms. He, he, he was the one who had civil liberties concerns, not Dick Helms. Dick Helms backed Nixon on that. Um, he backed him on expanding the war into Cambodia in May 1970, one of the most controversial actions of his presidency. So Helms backed up Nixon's policies, especially in the area of domestic surveillance. And so what you have in the lead up to Watergate is you have two things that are not that different. Authorized government agencies seeking you know, the authority to break in to uh, perceived enemies of the United States, and you have the Nixon White House, which is basically seeking to do the exact same thing on behalf of the president's reelection committee. Well, those two things just converged in Watergate. The, the, the policy that Helms endorsed became the justification for the crimes that the burglars committed. And so that collaboration between Nixon and, and, and Helms, including the recommendation of Hunt to the White House, that's what created the, uh, the the squad of burglars. Without Howard Hunt and without Helms, Nixon would have had no burglars and the whole thing never would have happened the way it happened. Indeed it was. But, you know, one of the things you talk about in the book is that, if you will, the dance between the two of them, Nixon and Helms. But as we know, the director of central intelligence serves at the pleasure of the president. Yet Helms is an inherited director, so to speak. And for Richard Nixon, was it not important to have someone that he would view as a loyalist, someone he would view as leading an agency that he felt was an essential agency to have some sort of sway over? Why do you think that allowed Helms to not only keep, I'm sorry, not, why it allowed Nixon to keep Helms on uh, before the Watergate period, but you know, all the way through the period leading up to the events itself? Um, I, I think it's because Helms supported his policies. 
Um, and so he overcame his suspicion of the CIA and, and, and the, the East Coast types who ran it because Helms was helping him. And Helms had, you know, when Nixon wanted a dirty trickster, Helms provided Howard Hunt. So, you know, uh, uh, Nixon, I think, you know, was very comfortable with Helms. And w one of the things I talk about in the book is, in fact, we now know the two men have a, conver a friendly conversation about 14 hours before the burglars are caught. Um, which is very friendly. And so you can see the two men are really on the same team by, you know, by the end of Nixon's first term, right on the brink of the disaster that's going to bring them both down. So let's stay on this aspect of this first major revelation in the book, Scorpion's Dance, which is bringing to the forefront the heretofore hidden role of, yeah. of the CIA. And what does it mean to you, Jeff, in terms of the historical narrative, where up to now, as you said, the CIA has kind of been seen as being on the periphery, but with what you uncover, it's a much more uh, protagonist style role. And how does it mean that we should look now at Watergate on this 50th anniversary year with the idea that perhaps the CIA was not just more involved, that again, perhaps maybe even played an essential role. What does that mean for history? And how did you come to find that in the pages of Scorpion's Dance? Well, one of the things that was most convincing to me was not only was, was was Helms good friends with Howard Hunt, and I document kind of that friendship, the, their lunches, you know, uh, wedding gifts, uh, um, favors that they did for each other, but that also once the burglars were working, we have credible. It's, I wouldn't say it's totally conclusive, but there is strong evidence that Hunt was passing any information that the burglars obtained back to Helms through the CIA office in the NSC in the White House. And two CIA officers testified to that later, that that's what Hunt was doing. McCord, on his part, he was keeping the transcripts of the wiretap material that the burglars obtained. He was taking it home. And when, when the burglars were caught, he called his wife and said, burn anything in the house that connects me to the CIA. And the man who came to help her do that was a CIA employee who ran a big archive of files on suspected subversives, suspected homosexuals and all of that. So the information that, that McCord was gathering as a burglar, that information went to the White House because the White House had organized the whole thing. But the CIA, they're an intelligence collection agency. They were getting all of that same stuff. So that's one thing that, that I, I, I thought was very important. The second thing was, it's pretty clear that the burglars conducted many more burglaries than just that. Frank Sturgis, one of the burglars, told the FBI about seven different operations that he knew of targeting the offices of the government of Chile, uh, which had a leftist government at the time and was an enemy of the Nixon administration, targeting the offices of the of, of Chilean government and related people in New York and Washington. Well, those were not missions that the White House had ordered up, right? Those were national security missions. And we don't know who ordered them up. And I'm not speculating about who did, but I'm pretty sure that they weren't ordered up by the Nixon White House and that the CIA must have had some say in that. So that's just an assumption. I'm not saying for sure that it's true, but if it was true, then you can see, you know, this is really more of a joint partnership between the CIA and the White House, as opposed to, oh, a bunch of our retirees are working for them and we know nothing about what they're doing. That story is simply false. We know that's not true. Now. So Jeff, on that point, how do you come to the conclusion today? What was the CIA's institutional knowledge of the break-in on the morning or the afternoon before the break-in? Was there awareness as far up as the levels of Richard Helms, or was this an after the fact reaction to the events as they started to spiral once the burglars were caught? And, and that's when the role started to become much more engaged. It's a good question. I mean, you know, who, who ordered the break in? I mean, you talk to everybody who's written a Watergate book, you know, Bob Woodward, everybody, and every person I talked to gave me a different answer. So it's, it's, it's very uncertain. Let's just put it that way. I don't think that the CIA necessarily had advanced knowledge that they were going into the Democratic Party committee that night. I think that mission was probably ordered by somebody in the White House. But I think that as soon as the burglars were caught, 
absolutely. The CIA understood that they had a huge problem. That's why McCord told his wife to burn CIA records in his house and take down that picture in his office, right? McCord understood he had to sever his ties to the CIA or at least create the impression that they that he had no ties. So, you know, they're acting in a way that is very um, defensive and deceptive right from the get-go. Another thing that's very clear is within a couple of days, Helms knew that Hunt and, and Gordon Liddy, one of the other burglars, had burglarized the offices of the psychiatrist of Daniel Ellsberg, the man who had leaked the Pentagon Papers to the New York Times. They had done that the previous Labor Day. Um, within days of the, uh, of the break-in, um, Helms was shown the casing photographs that, they, that, that Hunt had taken of Dr. Fielding's office. So the CIA did not reveal that for another year. That was where they were really trying to tamp this thing down and eliminate any impression that the burglars were connected with the CIA, when in fact, the burglars had been working with the CIA, if not for the CIA, for at least a year. For those, again, watching at home, the book is Scorpion Stance. There's a green link right below Jeff and I if you want to order the book. There's also an opportunity to ask a question if you look at the lower right-hand portion of the screen. Uh, start populating any questions you may have, and, and Jeff and I will make sure uh, in the last minutes before we end this at 8 o'clock, we'll try and address every one of your questions. Jeff, there is another, a second aspect of the book that, again, I think breaks new ground, reveals new mm -hmm. elements, and gives us a new prism through which to maybe now understand the Watergate affair that you reveal in Scorpion's Dance. And it has to do where I'm based in Miami. There is very much Miami connection and a <laughs> connection at that. Uh, as we knew on the day of the break-in, when, or at least when the perpetrators were caught, there were three or four of them were directly of Cuban Cuban descent, uh, all of them residing in the Miami area, which kind of led to a lot of head scratching and wondering <laughs> what went up there at the Watergate Hotel. But you, you find some very interesting elements and you draw a thread line from Miami, Cuba, and even the Bay of Pigs to Watergate. Tell us about the Miami Cuban angle and what you found. Well, you know, when, when you talk about the two scorpions circling each other, uh, Helms and Nixon, you know, Senator Howard Baker said, Helms and Nixon have so much on each other that neither of them can even breathe. And, and that was really true. And I found out that probably the most significant secret that they shared was the story of the CIA's efforts to assassinate Fidel Castro, which went back to September 1960. That was when Nixon was vice president and point man on Cuba for the Eisenhower administration, pursuing an aggressive policy against the new government of Fidel Castro in Havana. And Helms was a senior official in the CIA, which had uh, enlisted two organized crime figures in September 1960 to assassinate Castro. So that story was one that both men had an interest in keeping secret. And, 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 and you see it in the immediate aftermath of the break-in, uh, when on Ju June 23rd, 1972, six days after the break-in, Nixon calls in Chief of Staff Bob Haldeman, and he says, look, we got to get Helms to stop this FBI investigation of the burglars. And he's, he tells, Nixon tells Haldeman, he's instructs him, tell him, play tough, Nixon says. That's how they play it. We're going to play tough. So Nixon's getting mean, and he says, tell him if... If this thing is goes through, it's going to blow the whole Bay of Pigs thing. And people always wondered, what? Why did Nixon care about the Bay of Pigs? You know, it was 1972. It happened 11 years before. It was there was no controversy about it. There was no issue about it. Why was he talking about it? Bob Haldeman said that the Bay of Pigs thing was Nixon's coded way of referring to JFK's assassination. And I show in the book that that was indeed true that Helms and Nixon had a conversation. Nixon called Helms on the carpet, demanded his Bay of Pigs files, and explained what he wanted. And on the White House tape, you hear Nixon say, why does he want it? The who shot John angle, he tells Helms. The who shot John angle. So that can only be a reference to the assassination of President Kennedy. And so what Nixon was telling Helms was, there's a connection between the Bay of Pigs in 1961 and the assassination of President Kennedy in 1963 
And if people learn about that connection, you know, you and I are both going to have a big problem. And so what you hear on that June 23rd tape is Haldeman's right. It's kind of like friendly blackmail. It's like, I'm going to support you, but, you know, you have a big secret. So you better go along and do and do what I say. So that's the motivation. That's the prime motivation that Nixon has when he's panicking after the burglars have been caught. How do I get this thing under control? Well, he threatens the CIA director with this very nasty threat. And when Helms hear it, he blows up. This is a very composed man, never loses his poise. He erupted at Haldeman and said, this doesn't have anything to do with the bad pigs. You know, it clearly did have something to do with it. And that's why he was so angry. So I, th that that was a, a constant between Helms and Nixon. What was going on at the Bay of Pigs? What was the aftermath of it? You know, how is it going to come out today? And so that's kind of a subtext that runs throughout Watergate that we, you know, we didn't really understand or know. I, I want to go down that path because that's a very tantalizing finding that you now confirm in the book. I know over the years there's been a lot of questions about what some of the references on the Watergate yeah. are. I think you've proven beyond a historical doubt what some of those are. But but going back to this Miami uh, Cuban burglar connection, you know, the, 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 the folks involved were obviously all of a similar background, a similar story. And I think one of the questions over the years has been why? Why were they using these assets from Cuba, from the Miami area to, to commit this when the CIA or others? What, what did you discover in terms of why those fo folks specifically? For two reasons. One, so Hunt was the burglar in chief, and he went to Miami on, on, in 1971 on the 10th anniversary of the Bay of Pigs, and he started calling up his old friends. And what he said was, you know, we're setting up an operation that is halfway between the CIA and the FBI, and we're going to get some dirt on Castro and the Democrats. And so he, on the one hand, these were Hunt's old buddies from the Bay of Pigs operation. Two, he was giving them a motivation. These guys, you know, by 1971, they were defeated, right? I mean, the, everybody knew that they weren't going to overthrow Castro. That dream lasted a while. But by 1971, the, the Miami Cubans opposed to Castro were completely demoralized. So when this guy, senior CIA guy working at the White House, comes to them and says, hey, we're going to do something on Cuba, they were like, sign me up. They, they, they wanted to do something. They had no idea that Howard Hunt had no influence over U.S. policy towards Cuba. He never even got a million, he never got close to it. But they were so eager to do that because, because of the, the cause of fighting Castro. So it was that animus that brings them into the project. You know, they know they're breaking the law. They know that's the assignment. And they assume because Hunt is in charge, they assume that the CIA knows all about it. And in fact, they were right. The CIA did know all about it. And so that's why they sign up. They think the thing's authorized from the top and they're going to resume the fight against Castro. Again, without Helms and Hunt, Nixon has no burglars, right? Without Helms and Hunt, uh, Nixon had one burglar, Gordon Liddy. He, the other six guys are all from the CIA. So and by the way, folks, again, if you have any questions you want to uh, put on the table for Jeff, uh, you can use the Ask a Question tab right below the green bar, which is the bar to buy a copy of Scorpion's Dance. If you haven't bought it already, trust me, this is essential reading. So this is the time to do that. You can also ask a question. But, but, but Jeff, let, let me come back because, as we know, the break-in itself happened 50 years ago this month, right. in June of 1972. But, but the events of Watergate don't really spiral out into the actual resignation for another two years. It's not until August 1974 when Nixon right. is forced to resign. What do you find in the scholarship for the book where Nixon's attitude is in terms of does he feel in the early days of the break in and in the first year of the scandal, he's got it under control because Helm specifically and he are meeting and as long as Helms is kind of on point, that's his ace in the hole. And when does Nixon start to realize it's falling apart on him and he's losing the dance with the other scorpion, Richard Helms? Well, well throughout through the summer of 72, Nixon was pretty confident he could ride this out. Um, and even after the indictment of the five burglars and, 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 and the two other 
uh, Hunt and Liddy, the two guys who were participating in the burglary, but across the street in the motel command post. Even with the indictment of those seven men, Nixon thought that he was going to ride it out. Um, but he was concerned. Um, and after he wins re-election, he decides that's the time to get rid of Helms. And by that time, I, I think... Nixon sensed that Helms was not on the reservation. You know, Helms was very adept at self-preservation. He was a consummate bureaucrat. And while he had helped, uh, you know, slow down the FBI investigation in the early days and prevented the investigation of certain leads, like the fire in McCord's house or the aid to the, uh, the support for the burglary at, at, at Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office, he had kept that stuff under wraps. So the CIA in that first year wasn't really implicated in the scandal. The scandal blows up in 73 when McCord goes public and points the finger at the White House. Um, and then John Dean turns state's witness. And then the White House taping system is revealed. All of that happened within about six weeks in 1963. And that's when the scandal exploded. At that point, Nixon had much bigger problems, uh, you know, once the, 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 the existence of the tapes was known. And that's when he lost control of it. He demands Helms's resignation at a very tense meeting in December 1972 at Camp David, and which Helms extracts a, uh, a face-saving appointment to be ambassador to Iran so that Helms is not fired. He's got this senior government position. He leaves his job at the CIA with, you know, reputation intact, that he was very skillful at doing that. But the scandal eventually does come back to, to grab him, but not for a couple of years. So despite the fact that at the time, the role, at least in the public consciousness, was on the periphery, what impact did Watergate have within the CIA, both during and then, of course, after the fact? You mentioned the forced resignation of Richard Helms. Does that lead to some either reforms or a recalibration of what the CIA is doing and dealing with the next president. Yeah, because because when people realize that, that how much the CIA had supported the burglars, the question of the abuse of power spread from the White House to the CIA and people began to ask questions. And Helms was out of there um, by by 1973, but his successor, Bill Colby, you know, these bombshells kept blowing up in his face, you know, and was really discrediting his the agency on Capitol Hill. People were saying, what the hell is going on? You know, we had all these denials. You're saying that's not true. And so what what Colby did was he put out a, 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 a message to all CIA employees and say, if you know of anything that violates our charter or violates, you know, the law, please let me know. And so these complaints start pouring in and people we, from within the CIA. This isn't people who hate the CIA. This is people who work at the CIA. And they say, you know, we're spying on the anti-war movement. You know, that's not our job. You know, we're spying on our kids. You know, that's, we shouldn't be doing that in the United States. There were the mind control experiments. People said, you know, we're giving LSD to people who don't even know what's going on. You know, we, we shouldn't be doing that. And so all these other complaints, which are not necessarily related to Watergate, follow the revelations that the CIA had been supporting the burglars. And so what happened was the lens of the investigations opened up. It's not just wrongdoing in the White House, wrongdoing at the CIA. And then people begin to see the kind of impunity that the CIA enjoyed. Plotting to assassinate Castro, that came out in early 1975, um, which was shocking to most people, at most Americans at the time. Today, we might people are more jaded and more cynical or maybe more realistic. You know, I don't think it would be too surprising today, but people in Congress were outraged that the United States was assassinating people. That did not fit with our self-image at that time. So the CIA was really in trouble by 1975. And the Church Committee, which is a Senate Select Committee, investigates. And the CIA is really held accountable for the first time. And that results in real changes in how the CIA operated. The CIA's budget was cut for the first time in the 1970s. The House and Senate Intelligence Committees were created to, to have oversight over the CIA. So a lot more people on Capitol Hill knew what the CIA was doing. When Dick Helms was in his prime, he had to go to one person, the chairman of the House of the Senate Armed Services Committee, to get approval of his budget. He didn't have to explain any operations. He didn't have to justify. He, he just had a blank check. That came to an end with Watergate and the aftermath. The CIA was discredited and had to find a new way to justify itself 
to the president and to the public. So th there's also an interesting coda to the Dick Helms story. And by the way, folks, please, if you have any questions, just ask them in the ask a question section on the bottom right hand portion of your screen. Jeff and I will make sure uh, to get to all of them in our last few minutes. But, but I still want to go over a couple of other fascinating grounds. And one is that Dick Helms coda. You know, Nixon, of course, is forced to resign in disgrace. But something happens to Helms after he resigns from Watergate. He goes on to another post, and then eventually he has a rendezvous with the, uh, the Congress that doesn't quite end so well. Tell us what happens to Dick Helms, the other scorpion dancing with President Nixon after Watergate. Well, this is the fallout of, 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 of when Bill Colby, his successor as CIA director, puts out that call and says, tell us of any abuses of power. Colby, with the one. Well, I think Jeff may have frozen up there. Give us just one second, folks. I think Jeff may have frozen up while we wait for him to come back. And, and for those of you watching, of course, uh, if you haven't done so already, please pick up a copy of, of Scorpion's Dance, just one of the great uh, books on the subject. I think Jeff is just having a little uh, computer freeze there. He should be back any second now. Uh, and also ask your questions. I see there are already a few questions in the question and answer section. We'll make sure uh, to get to those momentarily as we wait for uh, Jeff to rejoin us uh, in our remaining moments here on this conversation. Uh, it says he's jumping back on, so he's connecting. <laughs> Hopefully we'll get him back on soon. Wonderful. Uh, by the way, how, for folks that want to do more of this and, and gain access to more information about future books and books, author conversations, how do they go about doing that and getting on the, uh, the mailing list? So when, uh, co consumers sign up for these events, they automatically get added to our email list. So in our email list, we send out newsletters regarding events that are coming up. If not, they can go to the Books and Books website. Um, and we have a running calendar there that we update very frequently. Um, we have weekly events that go on both in person and virtually. Um, so you can come out to one of our books if you're local here, in my, one of our bookstores if you're local here in Miami. Um, if not, you can always join us virtually. Um, and we often partner with many different authors and publishing companies throughout the country. So Wonderful. And also this year, I think later, uh, hopefully the book fair, which Books and Books puts on the Miami Book Fair, nationally renowned. Uh, with some of the great author lineups. Maybe we'll see Jeff again there, but that's really something folks to pay close attention to as well. That would be fantastic. So uh, how are we looking? Are we, uh, are we, is Jeff looking like he's logging back on or maybe it's a, maybe, it's maybe he was connecting, but I don't know. Maybe we lost him. I, I re invited him. So he should be jumping on any second now. Hopefully he's not having too much of a connection issue on his end. Well, especially because that one question that I think is maybe the most interesting question, what happens to the other of uh, the big protagonists in the book, the other scorpion, if you will, the director of central intelligence, Richard Helms, uh, history doesn't quite regard or, or record that role nearly as much. And I think Jeff has a, a fascinating answer on that. So let's just give him another more. By the way, if you have any other questions, please just pump them into the bottom right hand corner of your screen where the ask a question note is. And uh, as soon as Jeff come back, so, comes back on, we'll make sure and tackle all of those. Yes, we will. Hopefully he's not having too much of a connection issue on his end. I know the weather down here in Miami hasn't permitted these virtual events to go smoothly lately. <laughs>
So what's your personal favorite thing or maybe new point that you learned from this book? Well, you know, I, I, one of the things where I think Jeff has done a service to history uh, in the Watergate story, the, the big thing that really brings down President Nixon is not only the revelation of the taping system that he installed in the White House, but those calls that were recorded, which uh, Nixon, under no circumstances, wanted them to become public. And one of those was what they call a smoking gun tape. And it's on that tape that leads directly to Nixon accepting that he's going to resign. There was that coded reference to the, quote, Bay of Pigs thing that Jeff, I think, establishes beyond any doubt whatsoever, historically, that that was a reference to the assassination of President Kennedy. And if that is so, what does that mean? And what is kind of the elephant in the room about that incident in Watergate as one branch of government, the president and the executive branch, duels with the Central Intelligence Agency and, and the meaning behind all that? Uh, the other thing, if we get Jeff back on, which I'd love to ask him, is that other famous tape of the White House system, which had an 18 minute gap in between that to this day, has never been revealed. That was purposely erased by uh, President Nixon's secretary, Rose, Rose, Rosemary Woods. And whether or not that also had a subtle reference to that Bay of Pigs thing, quote unquote, and what that might mean for history as well. So for me, it was certainly those two elements. And that's why I think beyond being just an incredible and fascinating read, Scorpion's Dance is an important book for history to have a better understanding and insight into what really happened and what was the true subtext of the Watergate affair. Very interesting. Thank you for sharing. This This conversation has been very eye-opening and a lot of different points of view than you would normally hear about in general media. Well, that, and that's why I think, you know, the book is so interesting. And even now, there's a bunch of uh, anniversary specials. I know CNN is doing a documentary on Watergate. But these elements, these aspects don't really get uh, covered as much because until Jeff's book, Scorpion's Dance, which just goes into great detail talking about it, it was we didn't really have the understanding of the insight. And, and that, again, is why I think this is such a fascinating and historically opportune and, and timely book. Does he have any other upcoming virtual events or in-person um, events that he's speaking at? I believe so. Well, first off, for those that are that are still watching with us, uh, there are two incredible articles. One that Jeff himself wrote in Political Magazine talking about this in a greater detail. Another write-up in The Daily Beast that talks about the kind of hidden aspects and the untold secrets that Jeff's book talks about. So I think that's gotten a lot of interest and insight. But yeah, he's going around the country doing events. I think he was at uh, uh, Politics and Prose, the famous bookstore in Washington. He's been doing some events all around the country. So uh, if you go to jeffersonmorley.com, I think there's a lineup there for those that might want to catch him in some of these other virtual spaces. That's fantastic. That's a good opportunity in case we don't get him back. I don't see his name popping up right now. <laughs> Well, let, let me let me take a stab, at least for those that ask questions. I know there were two. Um, no one like Jeff. But the first question was, what is the biggest thing that people think they know about Watergate and that uh, Scorpion's Dance says it isn't so? And again, I think people think they know the story and what actually happened. But what Jeff does in the book is to kind of reveal that the role of the CIA was not so much on the periphery, but it might have been, if anything, central to allowing this to happen and what the implications of that were, not just for the event itself, but for the history of that period and to this day. I think that is, without a question of a doubt, the most important um, insight and revelation that was made. And then for those, the second question, those and for, interested in further exploring the subject of the book, where would you suggest they start? I mean, look, the classic book is All of the President's Men. It certainly gives the angle from uh, the B Woodward and Bernstein journalism track that got there. So I think that's a great starting point. There's, there's also a film starring Robert Redford and Dustin Hoffman based on the book. That's another great starting point. But just catch any of the, the documentaries that are happening now. Those are all good starting points. But make sure if you want a complete picture 
and a complete understanding of Scorpion's Dance to do it by picking up a copy and understanding this book. Because I think the story heretofore has been incomplete. And now with Jeff Morley's book, Scorpion's Dance, you have a much more complete picture and understanding of the role of the CIA and how instrumental they were uh, in Watergate. And what better timing this book coming out now with the 50th anniversary? Just perfectly timed, a great opportunity to learn more about everything that happened. Indeed there is. By the way, there's also going to be a, a conference, I think it's this weekend, an online conference on Watergate. Jeff will be participating and even many of the people that were involved during the period that are still with us. So and that's another thing. I think you could check it out online, Watergate online conference uh, to take a look at as well. So that's another fascinating thing. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. So unfortunately, I don't see him popping back up. Well, nonetheless, I, I want to thank you and Books and Books, obviously, for the opportunity to talk about this a little bit. Certainly, Jeff, uh, it's unfortunate we had those tech issues there. But even in the time we had, I mean, he really did open up, I think, a new aspect of understanding what the Watergate affair meant at the time and what it means to this day. I mean, these are questions that the country is struggling with. Abuse of power by the presidency, uh, abuse of power by other institutions and governments, and what it might mean uh, in the future. Uh, we also had just another comment that CNN has a documentary now. Yep, it's airing on Sunday nights. It's an episodic series. You can also catch it, I believe, on the CNN On Demand app. It's It's been a fascinating uh, story that they put together. But without the angle of Scorpion's Dance that Jeff Morley writes about, I'm not sure it's the full story, which you will start to get when you pick up a copy of the book, which, by the way, you can still order right now on the link below, uh, right in green, where it says, Buy Scorpion's Dance here on the, uh, the chat room. Well, thank you so much, Fernand, and thank you to Jefferson, even though he's not with us right now. <laughs> um, this is a, an amazing presentation, and I know that I learned a lot. I just want to thank you for joining us, and thank you to our partners at the Miami Book Fair, and to all of you watching and reading. I hope that you will support Jeff and independent bookstores by ordering your copy of Scorpion's Dance. You can do so at the link below. You can do so on our website, um, at any bookstore. Um, and I hope everyone has a wonderful night. Oh, wait, Jeff Jeff is back. Maybe he can jump oh, into the <laughs> if, if folks stuck around, we, we got what? <laughs> Let's see if it works. Let's I just see. invited him back on screen. Hopefully he can just pop in. <laughs> Maybe. No, I don't think so. I think he's still having trouble. All right. Well, in that case, yeah. thank you again so much and uh, look forward to the next time. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in and for, uh, for watching and pick up a copy of the book at Books and Books, too. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. All right. Take care.